Hi, I'm Sam Post with Phenomenal Podcast. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Our guest today is Martin A. Lee. Martin is the founder and director of Project CBD, which is an awesome, comprehensive website that is unmatched in this area. He is the author of several books, including Smoke Signals, A Social History of Marijuana, Medical, Recreational, and Scientific, which received the American Botanical Society's James A. Duke Award for Excellence in Botanical Literature, named by High Times as one of the 100 most influential people in cannabis. He is the 2016 winner of the Emerald's Cup Lifetime Achievement Award. Mr. Lee is also co-founder of the Media Watch Group FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, and the author of Acid Dreams, The Complete Social History of LSD, the CIA, the 60s and Beyond. Project CBD is a California-based nonprofit dedicated to promoting and publicizing research into the medical uses of CBD and other components of the cannabis plant. They're dedicated to providing patients, consumers, and clinicians with common sense information on how to use CBD and other components of the cannabis plant therapeutically. This book that just came out, The Essential Guide to CBD, is a reliable, easy to understand primer written by the editors of Reader's Digest and the experts at Project CBD. Drawing from peer-reviewed research and medical studies, as well as interviews with neuroscientists and doctors, the Essential Guide to CBD debunks common myths and rebuffs pseudoscience. You'll learn the basics of what CBD is and how it works, how it can be helpful against more than 30 health conditions, and how to pick the type of product that will work best for your needs. The book also contains recipes and first-person accounts from real people who have used it. The Essential Guide to CBD tells you everything you need to know about the natural, the all-natural treatment that's sweeping the nation, and that's why it's worth the hype. So I was going to like describe the book, but then I saw the copy on the jacket of the book, and that was, that's what it is. It's, it, it gets into detail with science that I, I can't understand, but it's also basic and understandable, very well written. Mr. Lee, thank you so much for being here with us. Well, it's my pleasure. Happy to join you. So you're the founder of Project CBD. When did you start that? I'm actually the co-founder, and, and it was launched in 2010. You know, so we're now 11 years past that. Um, and when we first uh, launched Project CBD, it was really meant to be an educational effort to inform uh, doctors and patients within the medical cannabis community in California, which is where we're based. Because at that time in 2010, there was very little known about CBD. Now everybody hears about CBD. You can get it in gas stations. And so you know, it's very well searched on the internet and so forth. But at that time, uh, over a decade ago, it was really only known by scientists because it was being studied um, for different healing potential, you know, for different conditions and so forth. Um, and as journalists, I began to attend these science conferences where CBD was being discussed. And I, I should emphasize these weren't hippie events. These were Nobel Prize winning scientists, hundreds of scientists from all around the world would convene to talk about the latest research into cannabinoids, meaning the compounds of the cannabis plant, of which one example is CBD, um, and what they could do for a person therapeutically. Uh, but the focus really at that time was mainly on mice and animals. Uh, these, it was preclinical research. And the, re the reporting that we heard from these scientists was so astonishing uh, that it made me feel like what a pity it is in California that medical patients who are using cannabis don't have access to CBD rich products. Uh, they had access to uh, products that were heavily oriented toward THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, of the high causing component of cannabis. It was also very medicinal, um, but you might say it's one-sided and it, it, it was uh, focused in one direction. And we thought if we could introduce CBD into the mix in California, which has always been a pioneering state in terms of medical cannabis, um, it might have a major impact if it did anything to people like what the scientists were saying that it did for mice, we thought at the time this is gonna be huge. And it turns out that in fact, it is huge. And, it, uh, and for ways that in fact, we didn't even fully appreciate because 
Um, in addition to having great potential for helping individuals with their health issues, we thought that CBD could really be key to liberating cannabis from the drug abuse paradigm. Because again, back 10 years ago, even though some states were starting to adopt medical cannabis programs, at that time, no state had uh, legalized for adult use. Um, the, uh, the focus was really on uh, the, ex the examples of the plant that made, or the varietals that made a person high. There's nothing wrong with that. That does have a lot of health benefits. But because CBD doesn't get you high, and because it does have a lot of benefits, we thought that if word got out about this characteristic of, of the, this particular compound and, and the plants that had this compound in it, it could really make major changes. It could, it could um, force people to rethink how, how, they, how they see cannabis. And, and it could take some of the pressure off from the federal government, from law enforcement that was being directed toward uh, medical cannabis at the time. And, and I think in part, our, our hunch was correct in that CBD has contributed significantly for, in terms of accelerating the uh, the, the pro-cannabis cultural shift that was already going on uh, before 2010. Uh, but when CBD was introduced, it really sped things up dramatically because when it came down to it is, it would be very difficult pill for the drug war establishment to swallow this CBD because there is really no reason for it to be illegal. It's not intoxicating. It has many health benefits. So why would it be considered a dangerous drug with no medical value? And in fact, now, of course, the FDA has legalized uh, CBD as a pharmaceutical, but only for use by little children with these terrible epileptic conditions where CBD has shown so much, so much promise. Um, but I, I think it goes far beyond that CBD's utility. And we're, you know, we're still in the midst of the reverberations of what we might call the CBD revolution now, uh, where it is available fairly easy for everybody from North Carolina to Alaska. It's pretty easy to get CBD, but the challenge is you know, to know what you're getting and to how to make best use of it. So that's why we participated with Reader's Digest in creating this essential guide to CBD to help dispel some of the confusion uh, and to shed light on some of the potential uh, for this you know, very unique compound and very unique plant that it comes from. Mm. It's kind of a reference book. Well, I mean, it has an index, right? And a glossary and everything. So it's, it's pretty good to just keep in our store. It's a pretty good reference book. I mean, we, we use the internet as a reference too. You know, mm -hmm. and we have a few other books. This is a good one. So you partnered with uh, Reader's Digest on this. Yes, I mean, that, that was very interesting because, uh, you know, Reader's Digest, at Project CBD, we, we have developed a fairly large audience globally. Uh, we get a lot of people visiting our website because we were the first one out there, you know, talking about CBD and so forth. And we've been pretty consistent. But with Reader's Digest, it, you know, they represent a whole huge media audience of their own that Project CBD as a, as a kind of a grassroots, I don't want to say renegade, but we, we uh, uh, you know, we were very much oriented toward, you know, moving the dial forward with medical cannabis. That's not necessarily Reader's Digest mission. Uh, but they wanted a book on CBD, so they approached us, and we decided it would make a good a good combination for us to work together. And indeed, you know, I, I'm very happy with how it ended up, uh, and and really happy with the fact that you could find the book in places like even like Walmart, uh, which is a represents a kind of a mainstream audience, far beyond the audience that uh, Project CBD was initially speaking to back in California. Yeah, that's. That's kind of a breakthrough, Walmart, and even Reader's Digest itself. Really. Yes, it is. It, it, it really is. And it's, a, it, it's interesting. I, I don't know if 10 years ago I would have ever thought that would, you know, it would have played out like that. Uh, but as you mentioned, the book is sort of a reference book in the sense that one can easily find and look up a particular condition, a particular health condition, medical condition that one might be struggling with or, or challenged by. And, and read some of the latest science, some of the peer reviewed research that's presented hopefully in a way that's very accessible uh, that discusses that particular condition that talks about the pros and cons from what scientists at this point in time understand about the potential utility of CBD because we're in a situation where there's literally been tens of thousands of, of scientific papers written about CBD and what it does to the brains of mice. 
and to the uh, digestive systems of mice and so forth. So we know a lot about CBD's effect on lab animals. And then we hear a lot of people saying that CBD does this, that, and the other thing for them. Uh, the anecdotal reports on the basis of the tens of millions of people who are now using CBD. But what we're missing is the, by and large, is the clinical research. It's actually uh, focusing on human beings uh, as part of scientific studies because of cannabis prohibition, because essentially because marijuana has been and still remains illegal on a federal level, that has blunted uh, the possibilities of doing the kind of medical research and medical science uh, that we really should be doing um, given the, you know, what the potential uh, shows on the basis of the animal studies. I mean, usually if the animal studies indicate something, you go on there to human studies. But because again, for federal prohibition and how we're sort of still hung up on reefer madness in our society, uh, that has really slowed the process down that hopefully we're, we're on the verge as a society of moving beyond that. And you know, as you well know, uh, many states around the country are now not just legalizing cannabis for medical use. There's, I think, something like uh, 30, well, I don't know how many, or, or strictly medical uh, cannabis uh, legalization. But when you put together that, plus the states that are now legalizing for adult use, and there's 16 of them, and New York is about to come online, that's huge. And eventually that will happen in North Carolina as well. It seems this is, this is the direction the country is moving. Um, and that hopefully should make it easier for people to access not just uh, the kind of uh, CBD products that you might get online or that are, are, are kind of restricted in terms of what the, the range of these products are, but hopefully you'll be able to get a wide range of CBD products that you can take in different ways and then ha would have different mixtures of CBD combined with other components of the cannabis plant, including THC, which does have a lot of health benefits. Uh, you know, that's the kind of situation we have today in California, uh, where Project CBD is still based. If you're 21 years or older, you can walk into a licensed dispensary and, and buy a CBD rich products, THC rich products or mixtures therein with the confidence that these products have been tested, um, that what's stated on the label in terms of the amount of CBD and the amount of other components is accurate and that we'll know that those products have been tested for over 60 different pesticide residues to make sure that, that there are only allowable limits of, of these pesticides or solvent residues and so forth. That's what we really need everywhere. A, 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 reg, a well-regulated market uh, where consumers can feel confident that what they're getting uh, is actually stated on the label of the product and they know it's relatively safe. Uh, uh, that's what we need, but unfortunately the FDA the Food and Drug Administration has reneged on its responsibility in that regard and is refusing to regulate CBD products, whether they're being sold in North Carolina or Rhode Island or Hawaii. You know, it shouldn't matter. These products should be well regulated so that people uh, uh, are, are getting what they're paying for. And, and that's what we're missing now, but hopefully we're moving that in that direction. Well, um, I, I know from your book, that there are 12 states that do not allow medical. In like December of 2020, mm -hmm. I think it, it was, it was, I found that interesting. But you said that the, uh, because of uh, prohibition federally, the not nearly enough research has been done. Have other countries done research? You know, there's research going on all over the world. And I, in fact, I should emphasize, there's a lot of research going on at many different universities and colleges in the United States, but only in terms of giving CBD and, and uh, other cannabinoids in the plant to animals. Uh, what we need is to move this out of strictly speaking the scientific laboratory and, and start clinical testing so we can see what the real medical applications are. Because it's one thing if CBD is shown to do something for a mouse, we don't know that's necessarily going to be the case for a person. Uh, you know, mice and people metabolize drugs differently, have different responses, so forth and so on. Oftentimes, results from animal studies provide a real good clue as to where things could go. And with respect to CBD, you know, where it's going is it's pretty, pretty obvious at this point that, that that particular compound has applications for many different medical conditions because it taps into how we function biologically on a very, very deep level. Um, and it, it, uh, it can improve our health in, in very, very fundamental ways. 
Uh, at Project CBD, we did actually a survey uh, where over 5,000 people responded from all around the country if they were taking CBD. Uh, we wanted to know what is it doing for them? You know, is it helping? Is it not helping? What is it helping for? Uh, uh, what success is one having? What, wh where is it falling short? And, and, it's, and the picture that emerged is that it, it does seem to be a general booster of one's health. It's not um, a, a panacea in the sense it works for everything automatically. Uh, but there are some situations where people are experiencing really, really catastrophic illnesses, epilepsy, cancer, and so forth, where CBD can do a lot of good. Um, and in other cases, it's, it's, it just seems to be helpful as a general health supplement in the same way one might take vitamin D and zinc and vitamin C, a little extra of that during the COVID period we're in now, that's a wise thing to do to use those sorts of supplements. Uh, it, I think CBD as, as a general health booster is, is become a popular supplement at, at, as well at this point, a very popular supplement. You know, it's, it's amazing the different uh, health challenges that your book suggests it can, it can help with. And it, it, and it explains it. It's really great because, you know, people come in our store every day and um, my answer is kind of like, kind of like this. Well, you know, yeah, I'm not a medical professional. I'm not a doctor or I have no medical training. So uh, I gotta be responsible for that. But a lot of people say it helps them with this, or some people have said that, that, that you know, it can help with anxiety, say, is probably the biggest one, right, and pain. And then when they ask about, say, diabetes, then I just like pretty much uh, refuse to answer you know, I so, said, you know, there's a lot written about it, but I'm just going to have to, you know, ask you to go look that up and read it. Um, I'm not going to be able to advise, you know, a condition like that because I'm not qualified. I think that's a very responsible um, response to, to, to those sorts of questions. And in fact, you hit upon a number of things. It's pretty clear from the kind of inquiries we get at Project CBD that the big three in terms of conditions that people are reaching to CBD for is anxiety, as you mentioned, pain and depression. Uh, those seem to be very prevalent uses. But we see on the horizon uh, the use of CBD for metabolic disorders, including diabetes and obesity, as something that is going to loom large in the future. Because uh, metabolic disorders have been identified as, by the World Health Organization as, as, as basically a global health crisis. There's already enough science and we're hearing enough anecdotal accounts indicating that something's going on here that CBD can have a positive effect for diabetes. When, when someone asks us about this, we, we share information uh, indicating that when a person uh, starts on a CBD rich regimen, they're taking about 60 milligrams, six zero milligrams of CBD a day, cumulatively total, which is not that big a dose. If they have blood tests measuring the sugar levels, the glucose metabolism, you know, before and after they go on a CBD rich regimen, just as I mentioned for six weeks or so, it's clear that their numbers move in a better direction, uh, showing uh, uh, less insulin resistance and so forth. Um, we're, we're hearing that anecdotally for, from several people, uh, but that's not good enough. We really need trials, uh, clinical trials involving a lot of people for diabetes and many other diseases. Uh, there is one such trial for diabetes going on of all places in one of the islands in the, in the Pacific, uh, one of the, these little islands where it turns out that most of the population is diabetic because of changes in the diet where they've uh, shifted from a, a kind of an indigenous diet to a, the Western diet. And as a result, they develop metabolic syndrome and diabetes. So we're waiting to see what the results are uh, from uh, this clinical trial. Uh, but I, I think there's a clear scientific basis for understanding how it is possible that CBD would be helpful for so many different kinds of conditions. Mm. Wow. Well, I think we need to take a quick break. We'll be back in just a moment. Hello, Brooks here with the Books with Brooks monthly book club podcast. We read one book a month and then we talk about it. Books like Stephen King's The Shining or Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens. If you're on the hunt for book recommendations and enjoy sparkling conversation, come read along with us and then listen in. So welcome back. We're with Martin A. Lee, co-founder of the and director of Project CBD and overseeing guide, I think, editor of The Essential Guide to CBD, which is an amazing new book. 
And, you know, I was uh, like, I'm, I've gotten really interested in science. COVID has had me just like really wishing I had paid attention when I was in school in science because it's really fascinating. And I always thought, no, I'm an English major. I just have to get these requirements out of the way. But um, CBD is based on the endocannabinoid system, right? It interacts with the endocannabinoid system and there's a scientific basis to what it can do for our health. Can you address that? Uh, yes, it's correct. What you're saying is, uh, you know, we, when we post the question like this, you know, why is it that CBD has any effect? Why is it that THC, the high causing component of cannabis, why does it make a person feel high? Um, and that's because these plant cannabinoids like CBD and THC, they augment um, and, and basically they augment the effects of, of, a, of cannabinoid compounds that our own brain and body produces. So there's plant cannabinoids and then there's endogenous cannabinoids. Um, and these endogenous cannabinoids are part of what scientists refer to as the endocannabinoid system. And this system actually regulates all physiological processes, it turns out, and that any disease state seems to be rooted in a dysfunction of the endocannabinoid system. This is what scientists, federally funded scientists at the National Institute of Health has concluded. So they said that if you can modulate the endocannabinoid system, it has potential for treating almost all diseases affecting humans. And that's a direct quote from a peer reviewed science uh, uh, document from the, from the National Institute of Health Scientists. And so what CBD does, it modulates the endocannabinoid system. Uh, so it has potential according to these NIH scientists for helping for almost every disease that affects humans. And it might sound astonishing, um, but the way this works, at least one of the ways, and scientists actually refer to CBD as a promiscuous compound because it does so many different things in the brain and body. Could, and you, could you hit that word? So could, so, sorry to interrupt. Could you hit that word again? Promiscuous. Oh, okay. Because it, you know, uh, it, because it, it, it um, interacts with many different receptors. It, has me, it, it confers health benefits and physiological effects through many different pathways in the brain and body. And one of the key ways it does this is by how CBD interacts with the endocannabinoid system. Um, because it ends up, CBD, it ends up mimicking and augmenting the effects of compounds that we, that we already have in our brain and body. But if, we, if, if we're deficient in these compounds or if something goes off with the system, uh, by adding CBD to the mix or to one's health regimen, it can really boost the functioning of the system. And the way it does this is as follows. CBD, and all the, the cannabinoid components, they're fatty molecules, they're what's called lipids. And as we know, you know fat, uh, oil, fats, and water, you know, they don't really mix very well, but the blood is mainly water. But CBD and THC and our endogenous cannabinoids, they are mainly fats. So how does, so basically the, the, the cannabinoid system needs help in terms of navigating uh, the waterways of the body. You might think of it that way. And, and the way it works is that our endogenous cannabinoids are transported uh, to where they need to go in the cell, to where they do their different thing, uh, on something called fatty acid binding proteins. You could think of these as almost like little canoes in our bloodstream. And on these canoes the, the, the sit our endogenous cannabinoids and they get transferred to different places. Well, what CBD does, it has this remarkable ability to um, basically to displace our, our endogenous cannabinoids, get on that canoe. So our endogenous cannabinoids can't go to where they usually go, which is ultimately inside the cell and to be decommissioned. So it keeps our endogenous cannabinoids around our cells longer where they do their thing by interacting with receptors and, and so forth and so on. And this has tremendous health benefits. So essentially when you take CBD it acts as what scientists refer to as an endocannabinoid reuptake inhibitor. It delays the breakdown of our own endocannabinoids, therefore extending their life, so it, it, and therefore extending the health benefits of these endogenous compounds. That's one of the profound ways uh, that CBD works. And that's one of the reasons why it seems to be very helpful for many different conditions. Because this endogenous cannabinoid system 
uh, is involved in regulating, you know, many, many different uh, physiological conditions. And, and, and there's, you know, I'm not talking off the top of my head here. There's clear and solid science behind what I'm saying, which is discussed in detail in the Reader's Digest book, The Essential Guide of CVD. And we talk about it in the context of 30 different conditions. So if we're talking about diabetes, we'll, 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 we'll focus on how the endocannabinoid system regulates glucose metabolism. If we're talking about chronic pain, we'll, talk, uh, we'll focus on how uh, the endocannabinoid system regulates the perception of pain. If we're talking about osteoporosis, uh, we'll focus on how the endocannabinoid system regulates bone density uh, and so forth and so on. And you can think of any condition, any physiological process, the endocannabinoid system is always there involved in regulating it. And that's why CBD can have, and THC for that matter, can have such profound and far reaching health effects. You know, this is something I'm curious about. Are there cannabinoids in other foods? I mean, can I find them in walnuts or chocolate or anything? You know, actually, it's a very good question. It turns out you can. In, in, uh, there's a particular compound that is present in a lot of different cannabis and hemp uh, varieties. Uh, it's called beta carotene. Um, and it's also, this compound is also present in all dark leafy greens, bitter greens that, that are really you know, good for us to eat. That's what our mama says, eat your greens, you know. Um, and it's also, this beta carotene is in a number of kitchen spices, uh, like a black pepper and um, uh, cardamom uh, and cinnamon and so forth. It's a very, very important spice, uh, a very compound, uh, spice component, because what it does, it binds directly to one of the cannabinoid receptors uh, that's augmented by CBD. So diet has a big impact ultimately on our health. That's well known, diet and exercise. And it turns out both diet and exercise uh, some of the health impacts are mediated by the endocannabinoid system. So if you eat healthy fats like salmon and avocado and uh, coconut juice, uh, things that we understand, walnuts is another example, uh, that are very rich in essential fatty acids. When you eat those foods, uh, they are broken down and metabolized into components uh, uh, that are actually are into metabolites that are very healthy for the endocannabinoid system and, 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 and make it work well. So diet has a huge impact on our endocannabinoid system. And so does uh, exercise. If we re regulate exercise, it, you, you, it ends up boosting our endocannabinoid system. It's, it's like a vitamin for the endocannabinoid system. So, you know, a lot of it is just common sense when you think about it, uh, eating well, diet, uh, uh, good cheer, uh, you know, uh, these are things that we want in our life uh, and by understanding the science behind the endocannabinoid system, we can understand better why an important, a, a healthy diet uh, has healthy effects and why exercise is healthy for us in terms of at least how uh, these health effects are mediated by the endocannabinoid system. You know, my chiropractor said the same thing because I went to him and said, you know, I haven't been here in a year because CBD has helped my back, but then I hurt my back. He said, well, it's not just CBD. You also have to eat right and exercise and take care of yourself in all, all other ways too. Absolutely. We say that CBD works best, best as part of a healthy lifestyle, yeah. which is not to say that if someone's you know, drinking beer and smoking cigarettes, you know, all that, that CBD won't be helpful, but CBD shouldn't be taken as an excuse to continue poor lifestyle habits. It should be taken to augment you know, positive lifestyle habits and it will have a greater effect. Uh, and, and on a very um, you know, specific level, when you, let's say you take a, a you eat a gummy uh, that's a CBD infused gummy or take a CBD infused tincture. The fact of the matter is science tells us that if you, if you um, consume CBD uh, edibles or tinctures uh, along with food, particularly these foods with healthy fats, you actually absorb more of the CBD and it has a greater impact when you take it. Uh, so it's not, we're not talking just in the general sense here, very, very specifically. Uh, if you, uh, you know, better than just swallowing a gel cap, swallow a gel cap while you're, um, you know, eating some of these healthy foods and you'll actually absorb more of the CBD in, in that remedy. Um, that's important to keep in mind. In, 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 are fatty foods um, beneficial since it's fat soluble? Well, healthy fats, you know, not necessarily all fats. You know, there's, there, when we think of fat, people go, oh, you know, we're fat crazed in our society. Well, I'm not talking about, you know, eating uh, processed food that upsets or dysregulates your metabolism. 
that then has a, a that induces obesity. We're talking about healthy fats that are very important for how the brain functions. That if you don't have uh, sufficient amounts of what's called you know these essential fatty acids like omega three and omega six, we get a lot of omega six in our diet already from corn and from other things. What we need to do is increase our intake of omega three essential fatty acids because it's those that when you consume them actually break down uh, in the body uh, into components that activate the endocannabinoid system directly. Ultimately, what's important is that we have a healthy balance between the omega-3s and the omega-6 essential fatty acids. Uh, but there's no, they're, they're, they're called essential for a reason because they really are essential. And the language that you read in these scientific documents, when there's a, um, a paucity or, or a, a, a lack of, uh, particularly of the omega-3s, they, they, it says this, has, this can have this can result in serious neuropsychiatric conditions if you're not getting sufficient amounts of this. So it, it speaks well to eating your hemp seeds and your walnuts, again, your avocado, your, your coconut. You can get uh, omega-3s from various things in the diet and one can look it up online. You know, it, this is no secret. Uh, this is all perfectly legal, <laughs> which is a good thing. Um, and uh, CBD fits into this in a really nice way. Oh, that's great. Never heard it said exactly that way, but I love that. Want to hear more about your favorite TV shows and movies that are on countless streaming services? Then listen to Up Next with your new favorite hosts, me, Kristen Aviles. And me, Christina Walter. Every other week, we'll highlight one genre, but two movies or TV shows, one old and one new. We'll let you know what's hot and what's not from your favorite or least favorite streaming services. And be sure to stay tuned to the end of each episode where we shout out an artist whose name you should know for their talent in the industry. So follow us to stay up to date with your favorite hosts from Up Next, a part of the Press Play Podcast Network. I want to ask you about how you put together this book. It, it looks like a, well, it's obviously it was a team effort, right? You're not the author of the book. You're the, are you the editor or, or, or the visionary or? Well, what the, book rep, the book represents a compilation and distillation of the work uh, that Project CBD has done over the years. And um, you can find much, not all of the information, but much of the information in the book um, on our website. But on the website, projectcbd.org, you can find a lot more information as well. Um, so what, the, what Reader's Digest wanted to do was to take the information on the Project CBD website um, and uh, you know, make it as accessible as possible for a very mainstream audience so that we could speak to people who aren't part of the cannabis world, who aren't already taking CBD, who don't necessarily have an open mind about this, but yet are concerned about their own health, about health of members of their family, uh, enough to want to know, well, what's going on? What's all the excitement about, about CBD? So really, uh, what Reader's Digest did, they brought in a professional writer, and I work with the writer. Her name is Celine uh, Yeager. She did a really nice job. Um, and she wrote, rewrote parts of the website, but then she also used you know, a big chunk of it you know, just as it was. Um, but she tried to uh, organize the information in a way uh, that, that really worked for people. So in a sen essentially, the, the book has three parts. Part one really looks at the basic, basics about CBD, how does it work, it gets into some of the science, so forth and so on. Then the second part has an A to Z list of 30 different conditions, breaking it down what the current medical science says about how, uh, how CBD can help those conditions. And then the third part of the book, which I think is very important for folks, is um, it helps people how to navigate the world of all these different CBD products, uh, there's so much information online. There's so many different folks that are trying to sell you this and that and the other thing. Uh, well, you know, it could be quite confusing and in some ways intimidating for a person, uh, particularly when they don't have an opportunity to go into a store directly, talk to someone behind the counter and get the insurance with they're actually dealing with the human being, you know, buying things online. It's sort of like, you know, jumping into the abyss in a way. Um, so, you know, to help a person navigate that landscape uh, the third part of the essential guide of C uh, CBD uh, or to CBD, you know, does a really important job. And I, I really credit Reader's Digest for, for, for that effort. One thing I love about your website is that it's not full of ads for CBD. I can, for, I don't think you do that. Do you advertise companies on there? Like no, you know, we, we've had, uh, we've gone back and forth about this. We're a non-commercial website. We're a nonprofit organization. 
Um, but because we were the first out of the box about CBD, we have gotten support uh, over the years from different companies, different brands. We act as consultants for them. They ask us advice about how to make CBD products or that kind of thing. So we've managed to, to, uh, to continue, but it, it is challenging to work, uh, to, to, you know, to have a group that where we're not selling anything and because you know, I have to pay writers. We have a, very, we have a small staff, uh, but what we're in the process of doing right now, rather than filling the, news, the, the entire website with ads here and there, we're going to have a dedicated portion of the website segregated from the educational content that will be a carefully curated marketplace of uh, carefully chosen brands um, that we feel real strongly about, that, that we feel good about, uh, that people will be able to um, uh, you know, visit their websites and so forth. What we aren't doing is setting up a situation where if you buy a um, product from that brand, money comes back to Project CBD. It's, it's not gonna be a pay to play kind of thing. We really wanna steer clear from that kind of focus because there's so much commercialism in the culture. Um, I, you know, we wanna create a like, bit of a safe harbor, we might say, uh, so people can just deal, deal with the information they wanna get. And indeed, if they, they wanna uh, be pointed in the direction of where to look for products, there'll be a place on the website, but it's not gonna kind of clutter and bleed into everything else. But this is something that's in the works we expect to introduce within the next month or so. I got it. I've, I've always felt comfortable linking our website, blog articles to yours, because I don't feel like I'm gonna lose a customer. You know, I don't feel like they're gonna, you know, there's other articles where there's so many ads for other products. I'm not so sure I want to send my readers that way. You know, there's, you know, there's good products out there. There's also some, some things that aren't so great. It's hard to kind of figure things out, you know, in, in, at least initially. Um, but what, I, what we steer away from at Project CBD and what we don't want to get into is a situation where we're telling people these are the five best CBD products for them. And I saw one recently for dog food, you know, and I'm thinking, well, how do they know that? Did they take a poll or survey of the dogs and the dogs told them? <laughs> How do, you know, how do they know if it's the five best CBD products for anxiety? There's over 3,000 CBD brands. Did they test every brand? To know? You know, so we steer away from that sort of thing. Um, you know, not to suggest that there aren't good products. There are, but uh, we, that's just not our role at Project CBD. We really want to stick to the education and to assist people in, in making decisions about what to buy without telling them what to buy. Yeah. All right, Sam, did you want to um, wrap up or give another five minutes of ending? I, I had one little comment and then I could, and then I could, uh, you know, can we do five or, yeah, or we've got five, five or less? Minutes. Yeah. Okay. Right. One thing I noticed in your book, and it's probably uh, some of the material in your book I, was familiar to me because I'd read it on the website. Uh, uh, bits, but one thing, your discussion of full spectrum versus isolate, that was, that validates what we've been saying, and my wife and I run our little store, and we really are learning as we go, but we've, we've steered people towards full spectrum. That makes sense, you know, by full spectrum, of course, we mean an essential oil extracted from the hemp plant, uh, or if you're in a state with medical cannabis or a uh, if it's legal for adult use, it might be a CBD, uh, the oil extracted from a cannabis plant, meaning a, um, a plant with more than 0.3% THC. That's the legal definition. If you're under that, you're hemp. If you're over that, you're uh, technically you're marijuana. But um, you, know, you can get essential oil from any of these plants. And, and as long as you're not um, uh, extracting just the CBD or processing it, to exclude the THC, uh, the, the little bit of THC that might be in the oil, um, that's full spectrum. And what we've heard time and again, and what science really underscores is that uh, the full spectrum uh, really has better efficacy in terms of therapeutic value. Uh, because you know all the different components of the hemp plant, when scientists really look at it and bear down, they all have, have medicinal properties. You can look at it one by one. Um, but when you put them all together, uh, all the different components of the cannabis plant or the hemp plant form what scientists refer to as a holistic entourage effect or an ensemble effect so that the therapeutic impact of the whole plant 
is greater than the sum of the individual components or greater than one component. CBD is a remarkable uh, uh, plant in terms of, or compound in terms of its medicinal value, uh, but it's, it has way more efficacy when it's combined with THC and the other components of the plant. It works better. You need less CBD to have the effect you were looking for if it's part of the full spectrum product rather than part of an isolate. Now, isolates do have their place. Um, at Project CBD, we're not down on isolates, but we don't like the fact that the legal system privileges isolates, which are the basis of pharmaceuticals, and makes them legal where everything else isn't federally legal. That's just wrong, and it's not in accordance with the botanical realities and the therapeutic realities of hemp and cannabis. Um, I'm, all, I'm all fine with isolates, but it shouldn't be the only game in town. And it's important that people have choices, that they can choose an isolate if that's what they're comfortable with, uh, but they have other options as well if they want to experiment to see what works best. Well, I've got one more question at the risk of uh, going overtime here. Uh, just one more. Um, the, uh, the one thing in your book, it said that 003 percent THC in CBD, in full spectrum CD, CBD, the legal limit is um, ar an arbitrary number. And, and I'm just wondering if, if you were, if you were going to pick a number for people who don't want the high, they want CBD, but it needs, it could be more effective if it had a little more THC in it. What, what would the number be? What would the best number be if they, it would had to, if they had to have legally any number? Um, you know, I think the, the best ratio of CBD to THC is one to one equal amounts, but you know, that will confer an intoxicating effect if you take a product uh, like that. And you can get these, uh, uh, you get that type of product in, in states with medical marijuana or adult uh, marijuana laws. Um, but in states that, uh, you know, what it really comes down to, it's not like a particular number, if it should be 0.3% THC or 1% THC, and, you know, that's the ideal thing. Um, it really, it's sort of the, it, it's a, it's, it's a, it's an antiquated way of looking at what constitutes hemp versus what constitutes marijuana. For us at Project CBD, the difference between hemp and marijuana is not the amount of THC in the plant, but the amount of resin on the flower tops of the plant. Hemp traditionally is a low resin plant. You know, the resin of the flower top of cannabis, which is traditionally called marijuana, um, that's where the medicinal components are, in the resin, in the sticky, gooey, oily resin. That's where the CBD is, that's where the THC is. And you can get, depending on the variety of the plant, the particular strain, you know, any, any, any uh, different ratio, you can get plants that have, uh, for every uh, uh, one part THC, 20 parts CBD, that would be a 20 to one ratio. Uh, that might not be technically speaking hemp under the law, but it's pretty close. And, and that's what we see in California, uh, that ratio, about 1% THC in the plant, uh, which would be too high for hemp. But uh, you, when, when, if, if it's 20% uh, CBD and 1% THC, and that's what's typically grown in California for the, high, for the uh, CBD rich plants within the medical marijuana program, um, that shouldn't get a person high, generally speaking. But I should say that we do hear now and then from people uh, that they experience kind of a um, uh, basically like a high, a slight intoxication, even when they take a CBD isolate, which I think is very, very unusual and unlikely. But I've heard it now and then to the point where I'm where I think it's not out of the question, and it has a lot to do with how an individual metabolizes these different compounds. Uh, you know, everybody's different, um, and it turns out, as we know. Uh, some people really find it hard to tolerate a THC. They find rather than making them relaxed and, and high in a way that people enjoy it when, you know, when they smoke marijuana, for some people, any amount of THC really gives them the willies, makes them paranoid. It makes them dysphoric rather than euphoric. And that has to do with their own genetic makeup, with what, what genes uh, they have that, that encode the enzymes that break down the THC in the body. You know, th this shifts and actually if th there's, a, a, there's a racial breakdown for this. About 20% of, of uh, Caucasians uh, have an, an, an anomaly, you might say, in the gene uh, that encodes the enzyme that metabolizes THC. 
So they don't metabolize THC very well, this 20%. Uh, so it stays in the, it, it feels like a huge dose whenever a person takes it. So those folks aren't really inclined to, to any kind of product that has a lot of THC. Um, and it turns out among uh, people of African descent, it's about 10% of people have this genetic anomaly. And among Asian, it's about 5%. I don't know why it breaks down that way. I'm not trying to cast dispersions uh, in, in any way, shape, or form in terms of ethnicity. But just to drive home the point that it's not just the, the product, it's not just the CBD, it, it's who is consuming it and how they metabolize uh, the, the, the compound that makes a huge difference and, and will have you know, a major impact in what they experience. Well, this is fascinating. We could go on, but we got to stop. So because of time and um, I'm just so honored that you're willing to come to our podcast. Thank you so much, Mr. Lee. Well, I'm very happy to do so. And I wish you good luck on your store. Um, and I appreciate that you refer your, some of your customers to the Project CBD website, uh, you know, and stay in touch with us. And maybe there's a way that, you know, our website can help your efforts. Well, thank you so much. And uh, so our guest today has been Martin a. Lee, the co-founder and director of Project CBD, and um, the inspiration behind the book, The Essential Guide to CBD, just published by Reader's Digest. Be sure to visit Phenomwell CBD for quality CBD and Delta 8 THC products. You can visit our store if you live near Salisbury, North Carolina, or order online with free shipping and free delivery in Rowan County. Join our Chillax Club and use the code CHILL for 15% off. Phenomenal is produced by Mo Barra and is part of the Press Play Podcast Network, which empowers hosts to create high quality podcasts that inspire and entertain. For more information, email content at pressplaypodcasts.com. Thanks for being here. Thank you.